So I would like to uh, talk this morning about mindfulness of breathing. It is one of my favorite topics. And uh, it also is a very practical topic. And in a sense, it's a continuation of the few talks I've given this year so far, especially the last two uh, talks on the Eightfold Path. The one part of the Eightfold Path that I went through in one sentence or so was mindfulness, uh, was the right mindfulness. And I think I said something like, mindfulness is a practice that brings us into the present moment with clear awareness of what's happening. Something like that. And um, one of the means that uh, Buddhism has taught since the time of the Buddha for uh, having a, a relatively high quality attention to the present moment, uh, settled focus attention to the present moment, is through the practice of mindfulness of breathing. And uh, it's possible that it's the Buddhist meditation practice that has been a common thread through the history of Buddhist practices down to the modern world. Um, I think every Buddhist uh, you know, school that I practiced in, there was some reference or some centrality to mindfulness of breathing. I started uh, practicing mindfulness of breathing uh, when I was first introduced to Zen when I was 20 or 21 years old. And I've been uh, practicing attention to my breathing ever since. And uh, it's been one of the great rewarding practices of my life and it still continues to unfold and develop and I appreciate it uh, immensely. And uh, I feel like it's been a wonderful companion for me uh, through this life and uh, provides stability, provides a means for understanding, provides a Uh, means for insight, for concentration, all kinds of wonderful things come from my attention to breathing. And it's certainly been true that uh, uh, spending time with breathing is how we become familiar with it. Spending a lot of time with it, getting to know it really well, the ins and outs of breathing, is one way to where we become enriched by the possibilities of uh, mindfulness of breathing. And uh, I think I had, I had no clue when I, before I started meditating that the breathing could be so valuable. Uh, I had a little uh, hint of it, perhaps, when um, uh, before I really started uh, meditating, uh, I lived alone for one week taking care of a farm, a small dairy farm. And uh, in that week of solitude, I discovered that my chest could breathe in a very relaxed way, in a way that I'd never known before, kind of a free, f- breathing freely and lightly. And then as I continued living that uh, rural life, lifestyle, outdoors a lot, working in the fields and stuff like that, uh, there was something about that lifestyle that f- continually kind of freed up my flow of breathing. And it got to a feeling sometimes that my, my breathing was breathing itself in a way that I had never identified or felt or experienced earlier in my life. There was a freedom, there was a sense of freedom in the breathing and a sense of ease and a sense of delight that my body was just breathing. And um, so I had some sense, some hint from that. And then when I started doing my Zen practice uh, and spent a lot of time with the breathing, uh, the experience of, you know, of uh, the value of it became clearer and clearer. And then when I was introduced to Vipassana practice, uh, that mindfulness of breathing practice continued. And it's continued right down to today. So, um, the, uh, and also this mindfulness of breathing is the only practice that I'm familiar, I know of, with it, that the Buddha claimed he did himself. Uh, he offered a variety of different meditation practices. He taught it to people. But the one he kind of specified, like when he went off to, on retreat by himself, he said, he said, I am practicing mindfulness of breathing. So, you know, so apparently it was quite central to him. And he uh, formulated, or we think he formulated, uh, a set of 16 practices, or a sequence of 16 practices. I call them steps having to do with mindfulness of breathing, where the breathing is the continuity through these 16 steps that unfold in a different way. And uh, part of the uh, value of bringing attention to the breathing 
is that the breathing offers two seemingly contradictory benefits. Uh, it offers continuity and it offers discontinuity. And the continuity is that um, kind of like if you're walking on a, on a, you know, on a wilderness path, if the path is clear, there's continuity of the path as you walk. But uh, as you walk on the path, it's a continuous path, uh, there's discontinuity in your steps. Your uh, one step has to kind of end before the next stepping begins. And the stepping is continuous, goes on and on and on, but the, uh, each step is, comes and goes. So the same way, the breathing is uh, kind of like the path, or it's kind of like the steps that we take, and they're, they're, they're continuous, that they just keep going and going. But, uh, and so what that provides, that continuity, is a wonderful check and balance for not getting lost in thought. Uh, you know, the idea of a distracted mind, a preoccupied mind, wandering off in thought, um, is uh, one of the big interferences to our ability to be really present in a clear uh, way in the present moment, to be settled, relaxed, and here. And so a big part of meditation is coming to terms with this, training the mind or relaxing the mind enough so that it doesn't wander off. And a big part of that is to come back. Notice the mind wanders off and come back. If you have a, a, this dedication to the continuity of breathing, it's always there then uh, it kind of is a reference point to catch that the fact that you're wandered off. If you just sit down to be present uh, in some open kind of way, you might not notice as much that your mind has wandered away and you're not present. But if you have the regularity and the commitment to just being with the breath, you'll start seeing your mind wandering off. So for this, the, the, the analogy I like for this is uh, uh, I, I kind of thought up when I was up in these creeks in the Santa Cruz Mountains here. I was sitting at the edge of a creek. Beautiful water, very shallow water. Maybe the water was probably three or four inches deep or something. And, uh, but the water was very, very clear. And, uh, <clears throat> and the slope of the river, or the creek, was very, very small. So it, um, I, I couldn't tell that the water was flowing. It looked like it was, you know, still because it was just no ripples, no current, no nothing. And uh, <clears throat> then I took a, a little stick and I stuck it into the water, uh, you know, perpendicular, kind of in a, in a vertical way. And then lo and behold, a little wake got formed, little ripples got formed on the edges of the stick that showed that there was a current. So the same way the breathing Mindfulness of breathing can be that stick that we put in the current of our life, the flow of our life. And we start seeing things that we wouldn't have seen if we didn't have that reference point. And we start seeing how much the mind wanders off, for example. We start seeing how much emotions are operating and influence, influencing us. We start seeing uh, some of the desires and aversions that are operating, some of the tensions that are building up and been formed. Um, I, because of my strong habit now of being aware of my breathing, I, it brings me back into my body. And one of the things I notice because of that is I've gotten tense. I'm having a conversation or doing some kind of task. And uh, I'm so busy with the conversation or the task, I don't notice anything else except what I'm doing. But then if I come back and feel my breathing, I say, oh, look, uh, my shoulders are tense. My belly is tight. And so... I, I discover something for me about myself. So mindfulness of breathing is a teacher, is a way of learning about oneself, coming back, coming back. Breathing is kind of the nexus, it's the meeting place of maybe our whole life. Uh, and it's remarkable how much breathing is affected by our mind and our hearts, our thoughts, our activities we do. Uh, the agitation and the busyness, the involvement of our emotional life and our thinking life uh, affects the breathing. As we get more agitated, the breathing gets more agitated or bigger, or stronger. As the mind gets calmer, you can feel how the breathing becomes calmer and more settled. Same thing with physical activity. 
you know, I think most of you know that you know, if you go for do vigorous physical activity, the breathing gets pretty labored and strong. And some of that's quite nice to do if you exercise or play a sport or something. But still, you need a lot more oxygen in order to keep your energy going and being active. And so how you are physically affects you know, your tempo and the depth and the fullness of, which, of your breathing. And it's in reverse order as well, that if you, if you uh, calm down the body, sit and be still, the breathing calms down, it gets stiller and quieter. The breathing has a reciprocal relationship to those other areas of our life. Uh, if we calm our breathing down, it calms the mind and the heart. It settles it. If we, um, if we uh, uh, calm the breathing down, sometimes the physical body begins to relax as well. We can expend a tremendous amount of energy in the body by being tense. You could be sitting completely still in a chair and use a lot of energy because of all the tension that's coursing through the system. Uh, but if you allow the breathing to relax, breathe deeply, breathe full, exhale fully, kind of begin tuning into your breath and kind of regulate a little bit, that uh, sometimes that begins to settle the body as well. So I like to think of the breathing as the meeting place of all these different parts of our life. And, um, and so, uh, you know, breathing changes because how we're, how the emotions we have, where we breathe, how we breathe. We might uh, breathe more shallowly, or we might breathe more in the belly or more in the chest, or all kinds of things shift and change uh, in how we breathe because of what we're feeling and what we're doing. And so to begin bringing attention to the breathing gives us a vantage point to address, to touch, to change, to have an effect, and to understand so many different aspects of our life. It's really a kind of a fantastic um, vehicle for for self-understanding and self-transformation. The, um, the, the, uh, in this 16-step uh, uh, instructions for mindfulness of breathing that the Buddha gives, uh, he talks about uh, breathing in and breathing out. And, and the word that he uses for breathing in, for uh, the inhale, is a word that normally will mean just breathing in the ancient language. But when it's used together with the word exhale, it, ju- it means inhale. So, um, now the, it's interesting, so the word is in Pali is asasati, and that's the verb, to breathe. And that's the first dictionary definition of the word. The second entry in the dictionary for the word is to breathe in a, in a free, or quiet way. Yeah, to breathe freely or quietly. So that's kind of nice. That's, you know, it's not just any old breathing, but to breathe freely and quietly. Uh, the, um, uh, and then it also means to feel relieved, to be comforted, and to, be, uh, and to have courage. Somehow, for the ancient people, this word for breathing has these other associations. And we do that a little bit in English too, right? So for example, um, we will say, you know, something has nothing to do with your breathing or something breath, you'll say that was a breath of fresh air um, by association. Or we have the expression, uh, I want some breathing room. You know, that guy had a lot of breathing room. So finally had some breathing room. And um, so for the ancients, they, you know, it was, uh, to have courage, to be relieved, to be comforted, uh, is associated with breathing. And so to cultivate, to develop in a, in a, in a experiential way, something we really we feel and experience and are nurtured by, a kind of breathing that is, um, where the breathing is, breath- we're breathing freely, maybe quietly, where there's a feeling of being relieved, feeling of being comforted or assured, and a feeling of being, um, of having courage. These are very important qualities, and that the breathing should uh, help us have this is fantastic. Because as the path of meditation deepens, there are times where uh, having some form of comfort from the practice 
helps us go through the uncomfortable aspects of spiritual growth. Having some capacity for courage uh, helps us to go through the uh, fear-producing sides of a spiritual growth. If you're on a spiritual path that's, not, that's never uncomfortable and never involves some fear, you're probably not on a spiritual path. <laughs> if you think it's all about, you know, just dropping in and being in bliss or being just, you know, just like it's all good, then you haven't really studied your mind or your heart. You know, it's, 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 it's a big deal to kind of meet oneself and see one's attachments and fears and conditioning we have. And it really helps to go through it if we really cultivated a comforting, a, comf- a comfort inside, a ease inside. And to have discovered how to breathe in an easy way, in a relaxed way, the breathing kind of feels like it breathes itself. Um, gives in, in inspiration, gives courage, gives capacity to go through things which are difficult. It's kind of like two things can exist together. A breathing which is easy and relaxed and a difficult, you know, situation that we're in. And then we're not caught by the situation. One of the wonderful things about mindfulness of breathing is um, uh, if the breathing is held, we're probably caught by something. If the breathing has gotten too shallow and we're kind of not breathing hardly at all, you're probably gotten caught in your mind. You're probably attached to something. And uh, and any of you who've gone to yoga classes, you know, you know, it's kind of, I think one of the most frequent prompts that I've, I, I can remember when I used to do yoga classes was remember to breathe. First time, first few times I heard that. What do you mean, remember to breathe? <laughs> you know, of course, I'm breathing, but you know there was a lot of holding because of trying too hard or the challenges of it or something. And so, but we do that in small ways. And so, to learn even the small ways that the breath is held or held in check or something, and then to learn to relax it and to soften it, we do it over and over again in meditation. To do this 10,000 times in meditation, it becomes a habit, it becomes a, a something we're so familiar with, so like second nature, to check in and feel what's going on here, that if you feel the breath being held, that's the, that's the information you needed to know, that uh, you, oh, I should breathe, I should relax here. You do that, you're, less, you're gonna be a little bit less caught in the, up in the situation that you're caught up in. Maybe not dramatically, or maybe enough that you know. Oh, okay, I can relax. You know, just okay. But let me breathe. It. Let me breathe and relax. My, relax my belly and just breathe. And then the build-up of tension, the build-up of of stress, uh, uh, doesn't uh, you know doesn't continue. So it goes in the opposite direction as well. So when mindfulness of breathing is first practiced. Uh, the practice is just get to know your breath. Just come back and be with your breath. Feel your breath. Establish yourself in your breathing. And it doesn't matter how often your mind wanders off from the breathing. It only matters how far you come back. And I say that because uh, so, you know, because some people have this idea that to be successful with something, you have to be successful at doing it. At mindfulness of breathing, all you have to do is be successful at is coming back, not staying there. Because it's almost like you're giving yourself a massage, uh, your attachment a massage, your thinking mind a massage and relaxing it. Uh, when, you, when it goes away from the present moment and you bring it back. Every time you bring it back, you're doing the massage and you're softening, you're lessening the strength of energy that goes into preoccupation, goes into rumination. And it might be insignificant how much you weaken that force by doing it once, by doing it 10 times, by doing a hundred times, but maybe a thousand times begin making a difference. Maybe 10,000 times makes a difference. And some of you are probably thinking, Gil's ridiculous, 10,000 times. I mean, why would I ever do that? Well, in a, in a, we, we sat for 35 minutes here today and um, and I wonder how many times you brought yourself back. 
during those once a minute, that's, that's 35 times. So, you know, what does that mean? In 30 days, you'll get your 1,000 times coming back. <laughs> what? Oh, yes, get a Fitbit that tells you how many times you program it. And, and um, so, you know, so it begins changing and changing. But in addition to weakening the forces of the mind this way, we're also developing understanding. We're developing capacity to, um, to understand what takes us away, how to connect to the breath in a nice way, how to enter the breathing experientially so it's pleasant, it's enjoyable, it's a place we like to be. And so getting to know the breathing and knowing how to breathe in a nice way, knowing how to attend to the breath. Where does it feel good when you breathe? What part of the breathing feels nice? What do you have to relax in your, in your torso so the breathing feels more natural and pleasant to be with? Because what we're looking for is coming to experience a breathing that you enjoy being with. That's nice. For people who are uninitiated or begin, that's not what's happening right away. It might take a long time to really cultivate a breathing that's really a nice, pleasant place to attend to. The breathing can feel like cardboard. It can feel mechanical. It can feel dull and boring. It can feel uninteresting. But if we allow ourselves to settle and let go, settle and let go, things begin to relax. And one of the things that relaxes are the forces and very strong forces inside of us that tell us we can't, we shouldn't relax. We have to be busy. And the idea that, for example, that the breathing is boring could be very strong if we, if we have living with discomfort and we feel I have to do something about my discomfort. I have to entertain myself, I have to fix something, I have to be busy, I have to do something. And the paradox is that there's that force, a desire, that impulse to what I have to do and fix and be successful and whatever that might be, do something, you know, I have to get something and do something, acquire something, even if it's just entertainment, um, is in itself uncomfortable. And one of the responses to discomfort that some people have is to do something, to get something, to want something. Do you see the loop we get stuck in? If the very, we start feeling uncomfortable, the strategy is to kind of get something, do something, and then, but the very feeling, of, in order to kind of settle that discomfort, but the very act of looking and trying to get something is itself uncomfortable. And, um, and I, I've, I've experienced it <laughs> in a funny way sometimes. Sometimes if I get too busy cleaning my house, I go around cleaning, you know, maybe in a hurry, trying to do a lot of the cleaning, and then I kind of, time to stop, and my mind is still kind of searching for something to clean. You know, like, I, gotta do, I have to do something, you know, like, I have to, I have to do something, you know, because you know, that's the mindset. So sometimes when the mindfulness of breathing is boring, or we feel like there's more important things to do, it's a sim- very symptom or very t- force in the mind that the whole meditation is trying to settle. So if you give in to the boredom, you don't allow yourself to relax and settle that to discover what's deeper, what's deeper. As the mind relaxes as we meditate, as the breathing relaxes, as the body relaxes, then we will find ourselves uh, in a very interesting place where the, the space of relaxation, it's kind of like relaxation and attention and awareness creates an, a, a space, room, in which our life can begin to gather. It's kind of like with the metaphor that the family and friends will gather around the hearth of the house. So the, the, your, the, the, your thoughts, your emotions, your impulses, your, your psychophysical life, all the different aspects of it, it kind of like that will come in and gather at the hearth, gather at the kitchen, gather by the fire, will come together. Or it's kind of like everything that's active in our life, centrifugal forces of fra- fragmentation, that things are spinning out away from each other, if there's space 
in relaxation, we're no longer feeding that f- fragmenting forces. Everything wants to flow downhill. Everything, everything wants to roll down to the bottom of the hill. So all the different activities in our mind and hearts and bodies wants to come to some kind of, some kind of wonderful rest. And so as we settle and get relaxed and make space, the space of awareness, just to be with things, that space allows things to settle. But they don't just settle, they settle together, they come together. They gather together at the bottom of the bowl, from you know, spinning up in the sides. And this wonderful experience of things becoming unified, gathered together, settled, is one of the great pleasures of meditation feeling whole, having some sense of integrity, no longer feeling fragmented. All the different parts of, our, of who we are gathering together into a whole kind of, is a wonderful feeling. But that is only uh, a stepping stone for going further in meditation. So we develop a pleasant breath, the ability to stay with the breath, have this gathering t- together, this harmonizing, that unifying for it all. Have the breath become a comfort for ourselves and a guide and a support. And, uh, and then it becomes easier and easier to stay in the present moment. And at that point, we're capable of something that Buddhism puts a tremendous importance on. Something that we often teach, and it's kind of like core to the mindfulness, but is actually difficult to do if the mind is not settled, if we're not settled and connected and here in a nice way. And that is to simply observe your experience. To observe what's happening. To have the ability to just settle back and not interfere with what's happening, not to judge it, not to be in conflict with it, not to be reactive with it. To have an equanimous, open, peaceful, just observing what's here. And some people will complain, just to observe is not enough, I have to do something. Observing is doing something. Because the mind is affected by what it does, you can't watch the mind, can't watch your inner life with a simple non-reactive awareness without changing it. And so as we, as we just observe and no longer interfere, then we start uh, witnessing a natural process that Buddhism will call the spiritual process towards liberation. And it's a beautiful thing to start feeling and experiencing there's something inside of us. There's wisdom, there's, there's a liberative force inside of us, a natural phenomenon, a natural process that wants to happen if we get out of the way while at the same time, we're just settled back and really watching, watching. Don't interfere with anything. But that, that observation and that ability to observe, really to observe, uh, is uh, often considered in the teachings of the Buddha a very high practice, a very highly developed practice. Um, it's how to, the Buddha called it, uh, how to practice in accordance with the Dharma or how to practice in harmony with the truth. So, um, so for the Buddha, this practice of mindfulness of breathing, uh, the 16 steps, is building and building and building until it gets to the stage, the last four of these 16 steps, where the person has the ability to settle back and just observe. And the whole process to get there has been a beautiful process, wonderful process. But then to finally, finally be able to just sit still and the mind has no tendency to wander off. The mind is stabilized and present and the breathing continues. The breathing keeps us kind of like the massage or the, or the, 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 uh, the beat or the rhythm of, of being present, of being here with all things, just as they are on watch. And then watching this process towards liberation, which is a process of release, of letting go, deep letting go, 
letting go at the very core of our being. Something can let go and release itself. And to have, you know, our heart release itself is one of the greatest things that your heart can have. And to find the place where the heart releases itself, the mind releases itself, is one of the results of mindfulness of breathing. So that was a pep talk. (laughs) And uh, for mindfulness of breathing. And um, occasionally, I mean, there are some people for whom mindfulness of breathing doesn't work. They've had some trauma in their life around around breathing, and so it's not a useful practice for them. And there are other things to teach, other ways of being mindful and practicing mindfulness, so don't worry about that. But um, but for many people, it's a wonderful practice. And uh, it's a wonderful to check into your breathing throughout the day. Standing in a supermarket, waiting for a light to turn green and, or you're driving, waiting for the bus to come. Just breathe. And check in. Make, make that you know, your home. And, what you, and it's, it's a fair chance that spending a few moments or minutes with your breathing in those kinds of circumstances when you have little gaps in the day is what probably be a, a better thing to do with your time than the alternative you have. So I don't know what alternatives you're doing sitting there in traffic. But it's good, you know. Breathing is pretty good. So, um, I believe all of you have been breathing for a long time. <laughs> and uh, we have a potluck in about 10 minutes or so. And it's nice for these potluck days for people to introduce themselves to each other. So if you don't mind taking a couple of minutes to turn towards maybe one or two people near you and say hello to them. Notice if someone around you maybe doesn't have a partner. It's just kind of so we're, we're inclusive. And, and then also, if you want to have a little bit more conversation, uh, maybe there's one thing that you know about your breathing, attention to your breathing, that's been nice for you in your lifetime. So one, one nice thing about breathing to share with your, your friends. Thank you. <laughs>